remember reading, you know, when I was growing up and everything that uh, Chub Rock was a merit scholar. So it seemed like school was very important to him. Uh, was it also like a really big deal for, for you going to school and being smart and trying to be studious or was that not as big for you? No, it wasn't big for me at all. Um, I thought I was going to be, um, uh, let me see, ever since I was maybe like 11 or 12, in the neighborhood when somebody would throw out an old stereo or TV, I would take it home and fix it. So that was my thing, the electronics. I would take stuff apart to, to see how it works. If my aunt or uncle stereo system would break down, they would call me, ask me to come and look at it. And I'll look at it again, figuring it out and fixing it. So after I graduated from junior high school, instead of going to a regular high school, I went to George Weston House, which was an old boys school for electronics. I made a digital clock, I fixed, um, I fixed TVs. Um, um, they had arcade games in the classroom that you would fix. So that's the route I thought I was going. But meanwhile, I was doing that. I was into music as far as DJ. You know what I'm saying? So now when I ran into that guy, Pete, you know, that's where my whole career shift. But with, but with what I learned at George Weston House, I put my whole studio together. You know, I built my own studio. Because I know electronics and bad, bad, bad. If something went wrong with an amp or whatever, I would fix it. My brother and I, we would build our own speaker boxes. You know, so I was the electronically inclined. <laughs> so I guess all of that schoolwork is what helped me into building my studio and maintaining it as far as, you know, as far as maintenance. Right. You know, I my own studio, speaker, bye bye bye, patch bay. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so when you started doing the Hitman or uh, the Chub Rock featuring Hitman Howie T album, Chub Rock's first album, mm. um, what was was it different to be focusing on making an actual album versus doing singles or doing some songs on like a whistle album or a UTFO or something? Um. It's, it's kind of weird because when I was working with Chubbs, I was just doing tracks, right? And he would hear the tracks and he will write whatever to a certain track or write what. I never put it with Chubbs, no, with, with none of the artists. I've never put, they never said, okay, I have a song called this and this is how it goes. And then I did a track according to, I always do a track that fits their, their flow, not what they say. You see what I'm saying? So I would come up with a whole bunch of tracks, tell me to listen to them, go through them. I want, I want this one. I got something for this one. I got something for that one. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, so. And then all that he wrote to, he wrote to enough to make an album. We never said, okay, the only time we ever did something with album in mind was the one. Okay. Everything else, I just had a bunch of tracks. You wrote a bunch of stuff. We put all stuff together. That's an album. Hmm. And the winner is <clears throat> a whole bunch of tracks. He wrote to it, he picked track that he liked, wrote to it. We had a whole bunch. That's the album. Because <laughs> okay. we had enough to make an album. We never went out with those two albums. Our focus was never to make an album. We just, I just did tracks. He heard the tracks. He wrote to it. He wrote to enough of it. Album. <laughs> okay. 
Now, with um, on the first album, Chub Rock featuring Hitman Howie T, the I Feel Good song was always one that stood out to me because around this time, rap was getting harder, more political, even, mm-hmm. even more street. And that one is very celebratory about being paid properly, but also buying property and all these different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember when you started hearing them write that or, or rap that, did it like hit you a little differently or was it like, oh, what is this? Or... Okay, now, you, now you're going to trip out. When I do, anytime I produce songs for whoever, I never pay attention to the lyrics. I may pay attention to the lyrics way after the song is done. It's already on vinyl or CD. And I listen to it, I'll be like, oh, snap. <laughs> you know, and then I start recognizing what the person said. And I was like, oh, like with, 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 um, with um, Special Ed, when he came and auditioned, his lyrics caught me because his lyrics and his flow. It was more of his flow, and then for some reason I paid attention to his lyrics. I was like, oh, crap. This kid is nice. And I knew Ed since he was, like, what, seven years old or something like that? Oh, wow. Right? So, but otherwise than that, I never pay attention to what they wrote. Because my thing is, my job is the music. What you put on there is on you. Because if a song is going to be criticized, it's going to be criticized because of the lyrics before they criticize the music. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Because if you heard a song, if you hear a rap song or any song, and you say it's whack, you're going to say it's whack because of the lyrics first. You're never going to say, oh, man, these lyrics are hot, but the beat is whack. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's the beat that's going to make you want to pay attention to the lyrics. Then you're going to say if the lyrics is is good or not. The beat got to get you there first. Yeah, that's so, if the beat, so if the beat is whack, they're not even going to know what you're talk, rapping about because they're not, even, they're not going to play it long enough. Yeah, that's something that I think people get backwards because rap is so lyric driven. But it's like if the beat isn't good, it doesn't matter. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Exactly. But well, they won't even get to hear what you say because the beat is not motivating or good enough for them to, to continue listening. Right. You so know that, what I'm saying? But my this, focus is always make sure the beat... I, my, fo- my focus is always the beat got to be good enough that it could be a, a great stone instrumental. <laughs> It could be a great instrumental song. Right, right. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I always say, I always say my beats is the table. The lyrics are the legs. That's going to make the beat stand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if the, you know what I'm saying? If you got a granite table, you know what I'm saying? If you see that blab of granite and you put that granite, uh, 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 tabletop on a cardboard legs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The grand tabletop may be nice, nice and smooth, the design, but if the legs can't hold it up, you know what I'm saying? So my part is make sure the tabletop is good. You got to put the right legs on it. Right. <laughs> okay. Now, one lyric question I do have, though, maybe you can help me, though, was with uh, It's So Hot, some of those lyrics were used for your bad shows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So why why did you guys do that? Because It's So Hot was never single. So we figured nobody heard it. Well, at least one person. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people didn't. I, I, trust me, a lot of people didn't, didn't realize that. Okay. You but know, I, uh, it has to be people like yourself that really pay attention to every song on somebody's album to say, oh, snap, he said that before. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Not, but not everybody's like that. Because when I heard your Bad Chubbs, I found myself rapping along to it, but I'd never heard it. I was like, wait a minute, how? Oh, 
That's what he talked about with the uh, um, the goo to the J with the fat boys. Uh, yeah. yeah, he said it twice. <laughs> so that being said, it's so hot. Also, seemed like uh, with the winner is that Chubb changed his his vocal presence, his style, his delivery. It got more kind of in cut in the pocket as a right. pocket, as opposed to being on top of the beat. So what? Yeah. As a producer, as his cousin, as his friend, all these things, what changed stylistically for him toward the end of the first album going into it and the winner is? Because um, um, back then, everything as far as the rap was more aggressive. You know what I'm saying? So anytime you hear stuff like rock box and, you know, and the way rappers were rapping at the time, so you know, aggressive, then as you go along, you start to find your own little pocket. You know what I'm saying? You start to find because when rap was done, everybody was trying to be like what was out and what was being successful. So they're saying, you know, if I rap like this, because this is what's you know, people like. The way this rapper rap, aggressive. So, you know, my lyrics, of course, will be different, but the rap style and the aggressiveness, I think if I do that, you know what I'm saying, people will like my song too. You know what I'm saying? So that's it's just a, like a process of trying to find yourself as a new, you know, artist coming into the game, having the opportunity to make records, then you just eventually just find what fits you. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And, and basically, that's what it was. It was just a learning process. He found himself at, at that point. And he figured, you know, the way I'm rapping, when I'm writing, my flow is more, I like this flow. I like the way I present my, my um, you know, my lyrical skills and my talent this way. Okay. Now, when you uh, had said earlier about Whistle going into singing, I noticed you didn't have a lot, so I was glad you said that. But I also was intrigued because on The Real Roxanne, the early, early La La, there is mm. she, I guess, is the one singing the chorus a little bit. Yeah. So what what made you uh, comfortable or what made that work for you? And no, it didn't work for me. It worked for her. <laughs> 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 That's what she wanted to do. I gave her a track to do it. Okay. That was never even even I think I may have played that record three times. Wow. So why did uh since you had toured with her, it was in a full force family, why did uh why do you think Select had uh the LA Posse, J Master J and others do the L LP on the production as well as you? Why didn't you just do it by yourself? Because um um, select one um, of the production style, and I think Roxanne was was being managed by Rush Management at the time. Okay. So, so because I was Roxanne's DJ and all that, you know, um, um, select didn't want her to have an album and me not involved in it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I end up doing songs on that album. It's because of um trying to figure out what's the word I'm looking for. I don't know if it's respect or whatever. But they figured, you know, since I was with her, since her beginning of her career, now that she's doing an album, they didn't see that it was fair for me not to be on it. Okay. Well, speaking of respect, that's another song you produced, and ESP wrote on that, and yeah. ESP also wrote on Look But Don't Touch. Right. So you had been working with them for years, then working with her. So what made you or her reach out to ESP to do some writing? Um, Roxanne was never a writer. You know, all her lyrics, you know, she never, she wrote the la, 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 hook. <laughs> but she didn't write the lyrics. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that. I think, I think her her sister's boyfriend or somebody in her 
and her crew who wrote the lyrics. And um, and I asked you to to write some. I oh. asked him, you know, I wanted to do that track, Respect. And I asked, I asked ESP, you know, to pen some lyrics for her. And they did. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.